we've already introduced different quantities for rotational motion. Angular displacement, angular velocity, angular or rotational acceleration. We've also introduced the concept of moment of inertia, the resistance to the change in any type of rotational motion. Finally, we've talked about torque, really the analogy for a force that we have for translational motion. Now we're gonna put them all together and solve different problems with these. We're gonna actually do connected body problems like we did earlier, but we're going to now uh, look at how a pulley can actually introduce uh, some uh, inertia into the system, some rotational inertia into the system, causing the object to accelerate at a lower rate. So let's take a look at um, one of the one of the biggest examples of um, how torque can affect the rotation of a body. Um, we're going to look at uh, the Earth, but again, understanding that when a rigid body is uh, subjected to a non-zero torque. The angular acceleration is going to be non-zero. And in fact, just like with Newton's second law, force equals mass times acceleration, we can relate the moment of inertia, okay, really how much the body resists any change, to both the acceleration and the torque through Newton's second law for rotational bodies. Again, we've replaced force with torque. We've replaced mass with moment of inertia. And we've replaced uh, translational acceleration with regular acceleration. So again, let's take a look at the largest example of this, where uh, torque plays a very big role in our lives. Uh, basically, the Earth and the Moon interact through gravity. Gravitational tides cause the ocean to go up and down, which you might not be aware of is that the gravitational bulges due to these uh, tides actually uh, gets out in front of the moon in its orbit because the Earth rotates faster than the moon orbits. Now, back when we were talking about satellites, we int introduced the concept of a geostationary orbit where if the orbit's far enough away from the Earth, okay, it is going to have a rotational period an orbital period that matches the rotational period of the Earth. If you're just in low Earth orbit, period of orbit's about 90 minutes. If you're in geostationary orbit, period of orbit is 24 hours. If we go even further out, that period of the orbit gets longer and longer until we finally get out to the moon. And the period of time known as a month is roughly based on how long it takes the moon to go around the Earth. There's some combined motion with the Earth going around the, the sun and the moon going around the Earth. But basically we can expect the phases of the moon to go through a complete cycle, basically on a, a monthly basis. Did you know that at one time, the rotational velocity of the Earth was much greater and the moon orbited much closer? What's happened here is that the moon puts a torque on the Earth. That's because again, rotating at 24 hours, the moon is going to pull out these gravitational bulges, these tidal bulges, but then they're going to get out ahead of the moon. That means that there's more mass closer to the moon at these at these rotational, at these tidal bulges, and the moon is going to pull back on this or create a negative torque slowing down the Earth. Now, this is not a lot of torque with respect to the angular momentum that the Earth has. So it's not going to have a huge impact on our day, meaning that we can't notice any change in, in the length of the day due to this torque. However, if we go back about 3.5 billion years, our Earth had a nine-hour day. And as time's gone by, we know that the torque is equal to I alpha. Even though alpha is really, really small, if you, we make our time large enough, we can get a significant amount in terms of the change in the angular velocity, okay? So again, about 3.5 billion years ago, the moon was orbiting much closer to the earth. Um, since what's happened is uh, we have put a torque on the moon actually causing its orbit to expand, but it's put a torque equal and opposite on us. 
extending our nine hour day to 24 hours. Okay, let's take a look at a simpler system. We're gonna look at the simplest system that we can come up with, with in terms of a, a rotational system, that's a connected body. We're gonna look at a pulley, which is part of a well, connected to a bucket, which is going to provide mass. So as you might expect, if we let go of this pulley, um, gravity is gonna pull the bucket down, the bucket is going to accelerate, and that is going to put a torque on this wheel, on this pulley, causing it to accelerate um, in terms of angular velocity. Now, it's a connected body because the tension pulling up on the bucket is going to also provide a torque on the pulley. And somehow I have to connect the descending motion, the translational mo motion of the bucket going down the well, with the rotational motion of the pulley as it receives a torque. So again, let's treat this pulley as basically a, a thin cylinder. Um, it's the only part of this that is rotating, so it is going to be subjected to uh, the Newton's second law for rotational bodies. The sum of the torques is equal to I alpha. For the bucket, I'm going to apply the sum of the forces is equal to mass times acceleration. Now, I'm going to get two equations here, okay? Because I'm going to have two unknowns. I don't know the tension. I don't know the acceleration. I don't know the torque, and I don't know the angular acceleration. So to connect this equation to this equation so I can solve them simultaneously, I have to say A is equal to R alpha, and also that the torque is equal to R times T. So um, again, I'm gonna have these uh, two basic equations. You know, technically I have four equations here. I have this equation, this equation, this equation, and torque equals R times the tension, okay? And our four unknowns are uh, torque and alpha, uh, tension and A. But again, um, the two main equations are these two right here. This just bridges, along with the, the torque equation, bridges the two equations together. So we're going to see how we, we go about and solve this. Now, when we did connected bodies for just translational motion, we did a free body diagram for each. That's what we did here. And then we solved the equations, Newton's laws, for each body. We're going to do the same thing here. We have this um, flywheel, this pulley, which is going to have, let's say, a mass of five kilograms. That's pretty massive for, for a pulley, but uh, we want it to be massive enough to really have an, an impact on, on the motion here. Uh, it's going to have a radius of 20 centimeters here, and basically it's connected to a massless string, okay, massless rope which um, connects to a bucket of water, uh, which is one kilogram. So it has a weight of 9.8 Newtons. And I wanna know what the forces are on the flywheel and the bucket. Now, first of all, this flywheel is going to be in translational equilibrium. The tension is gonna pull down, the force of gravity is gonna pull down on the pulley. And of course, there's gonna be a reaction force at the axle, which is going to respond, just like if you're standing on the floor, the floor pushes you up with an equal amount of force that you push down on it, the axle is gonna do the same thing here. Well, nothing's really interesting going on here other than if you wanna find out this reaction force, but I don't know the tension here, so I can't even find that, okay? Um, not really interesting because I know the forces are equal to zero. It has no impact on the motion at all. I'm interested, you know, more in the motion of, of what's going on here, but I'll come back and I'll solve for that reaction force. However, the reaction force and the weight of the pulley do not create any torque. The only torque I get is from that downward pull from the bucket, and that's going to create a force which is tangential to this wheel right here. So what I can say is, okay, the sum of the torques, I only have one torque acting on this. 
the sum of the torques is equal to F R, I'm sorry, RF sine theta. Theta here is 90 degrees, so sine theta is one. It just becomes uh, T times R, the tension times the radius of the, the wheel right here. That's your moment arm for a pulley. It's just the radius of, of the, of the uh, pulley wheel. So T times R, we're given R, 0.2 meters, is equal to the moment of inertia for a cylinder times alpha, which is the angular acceleration. Well, for a cylinder, I is equal to one half MR squared. Okay, so we take one half the mass of the pulley times its radius squared, and that gives me a moment of inertia of 0.1 kilogram meter squared. Okay, so I can plug that right in up here. I have the tension is equal to 0.2 meters times 0.1 kilogram meters squared times alpha. Okay, I'm gonna make another substitution here. Okay, I'd, I want all my, all my quantities in terms of translational um, quantities. I want uh, alpha uh, turned into A, and I want, um, you know, here, I didn't differentiate between A and alpha here, but uh, again, alpha is equal to A over R. So I can replace alpha with uh, five inverse meters times A. So that's going to go here. This is going to go here. So apologize for that. And now I've turned my torque equation into things that just contain translational quantities, tension and acceleration. I'm doing this because I need to connect what's happening with the pulley to what is actually happening with the descending bucket, okay? So tension is equal to 0.5 kilogram meters, okay? Uh, divided by uh, 0.2 meters, and that's gonna give me the acceleration, all right? So um, again, I still have uh, two unknowns here. Um, I've related uh, the tension to the torque, the angular acceleration to the translational acceleration, but I, I still don't have T or A here. So now that I've finished with this, I've gone as far as I can go with this, I'm going to look at the bucket. Okay, bucket's easy. We've done this before. The sum of the forces is equal to mass times acceleration. The tension pulls up, my weight pulls down. T equals uh, negative, I'm sorry, T minus W equals MA. W here is MG. Um, MA, A is going to be in the negative direction. Okay. So I now solve for this. And I get that the tension minus the weight is equal to negative one times A. I've taken A to be in the negative direction. That's where the negative sign came from. And now I have my second equation. So I can just take this equation, plug it into this equation, and I have my acceleration, okay? By plugging this one into this one, I can get rid of the tension. My equations just become in terms of acceleration. So this combined with this becomes this, okay? This goes here, this goes here. So I switched them around. I solve for A, combining all my A terms. I'll add one kilogram times acceleration to both sides. And I find out that the bucket accelerates at 2.8 meters per second squared. Now, this is important because if we think about this, if I cut the rope, this bucket would be descending at 9.8 meters per second squared because there are no other forces acting on it. But we can see clearly that the rotational inertia of this pulley is slowing down, this, down, down the system and it's creating more um inertia against the motion so instead of accelerating at 9.8 we're accelerating at less than a third of the the bucket's acceleration if it were in free fall once i have a i can plug that back in up here right either equation will work this is the easier one i'll just take 2.5 kilograms times 2.8 meters per second squared that'll give me the tension of the rope seven newtons and essentially, I know everything I need to know about the, the bucket here, okay? 
Now let's go back to the wheel. I know the tension, I know the weight, I know the acceleration, but here I'm gonna take these quantities and I'm gonna put them back into what this wheel is doing. How fast is it accelerating? How much torque does it have on it, okay? So in terms of determining the torque, that's easy. We know that torque is equal to force times the uh, moment arm. In this case, we have seven newtons from the tension. That's the only force acting on it. We have 0.2 meters for the moment arm, the radius of the pulley. That's 1.4 newton meters. Alpha, this time I got it right, is equal to A divided by R, 2.8 divided by 0.2. And that gives me an angular acceleration of 14 radians per second squared. Now, if I want to go back to find out the reaction force on the axle, I could do that also. Remember, I found the tension, okay? The tension was seven newtons. The pulley pulls down with 49 newtons of weight. So the reaction force is 56 newtons. But again, it's a fairly si simple system. There are only two things I had to um, look at here, the bucket and the pulley. Um, two unknowns, a tension and an, an acceleration. And basically I got two equations by analyzing each um, element individually, and then I put everything together. Okay, let's go to something even more complicated. If you remember, we had the Atwoods machine, and the Atwoods machine had to use a very light pulley where essentially the moment of inertia of the pulley didn't really affect the outcome. But what if that pulley were more massive and it did have some effect? Well, in this case, I'm going to have to take a look at the mass of the uh, ascending block, the mass of the descending block, and the overall inertia of this pulley here. I'm going to have three different things I need to analyze. But I also need to, to realize if this pulley is going to rotate and it has a moment of inertia, the torque on it can't be zero. Okay. What I mean by that is the tension on this side has to be different from the tension on this side. Otherwise, this pulley would never start rotating. Okay, very important thing here. The tension here does not equal the tension here. If this is not going to slip, okay, what that means is that the tension pulling down here will be opposed by the uh, torque due to the moment of inertia here and also this other mass right there. So you're not going to have a balanced tension on each side. So I'm going to have to call this tension one and tension two, like they're two different ropes, even though they're part of the same system here. Okay, here we go. Mass one, 10 kilograms. Mass two, 20 kilograms. So we know mass two is going to descend. The pulley has a mass of eight kilograms. And it's a radius, we'll keep it to 20 centimeters. Okay, the pulley turns without the rope slipping. Let me do an analysis for each of the elements here. So we're going to start out again by saying T2 is going to be different from T1. That basically T2 has to be greater than T1 because we we know that this, this pulley is going to rotate in a clockwise direction. Okay. You know, if you've ever watched enough pulleys, you, you have the intuition that tells you it's going to go clockwise, which means there, there's going to be a negative torque there. Right. So let's do our free body diagram for mass one. Mass one is pulled up by T1. It's pulled down by weight one. And again, if we look at this, mass one gets pulled down here. The tension one is going to pull up on it. And this mass one is going to accelerate upward because mass two is heavier. So my acceleration is the, in the positive direction. T1 is in the positive direction. Uh, W1 is down. So Here's my first equation right here. The sum of the forces, the tension minus the weight is equal to mass times acceleration. There's no negative sign on the right-hand side because A is going to be in the positive vertical direction. I solve for T1, moving all the other elements to the right-hand side of the equation. I get T1 is equal to M1A plus G. We've done this before, so um, that should be no problem for we're uh, applying it to this particular case. Same thing for M2, except for the acceleration is reversed. 
M2 is going down, so we're going to have a negative acceleration. T2 pulls up, W2 pulls down. So tension up minus weight down is equal to negative M2A. We put these into the, the equation, and T2 equals M2G minus A. Okay, so one equation for M1, one equation for M2. Now we're going to put this and uh, apply it to the pulley. All right, so what do we have for our pulley? Again, tension two is going to be greater than tension one. So we're going to have a net torque in the clockwise direction. That's going to be a negative torque. So the acceleration pulling down this way is going to give us a negative angular acceleration. Okay. T1 is the moment arm uh, times T1. I'm sorry, tau 1. The torque due to mass 1 is R times T1. The torque due to the tension from mass 2 is R times T2. Notice that the Rs are the same. They're both 20 centimeters or 0.2 meters. The tensions, again, have to be different. And again, here's our angular acceleration. So the sum of the torques, notice I have two, this one and this one, T1 creates a positive torque because we're going counterclockwise. If T1 were the only thing attached, this would rotate counterclockwise, a positive torque. But T2 is greater, so it's going to cause a negative torque. And of course, we can see that the difference of the two torques are going to result in a net torque in the counterclockwise direction. So um, here I put the moment of inertia. Again, we're dealing with, with base, basically a thin cylinder. That's one half mR squared. I plug that in here. So that goes here. I replace alpha with negative A over R. That goes over here. I can divide both sides by R. And I get um, this equation right here, where R basically comes out of the equations. This R squared divided by R just gives me R. I divide both sides by R. I'm down to this. So I'm down to three equations, three unknowns. Okay, I've got this equation here, which relates T1 to the acceleration. I have this equation here, which relates T2 to the acceleration. And finally, I have my new equation, which relates T1, T2, and A. So my best approach here would be to take my first two equations, this one and this one, and plug them into my third equation. So I'm going to put this one here. I'm going to put this one here. Set them equal to this. Okay. I want to solve for A because my tension is now gone. Okay. Put all my A terms on the left. Put all my non-A terms on the right. Just separate them. So I move this to the other side. Here are all my uh, terms. Sorry about this extra A. That shouldn't be sitting there. But once I, I solve for A, I get A is equal to G, M2 minus M1 over M1 plus M2 plus one half M. So what is the net result of the system? Okay. The more mass of the pulley, the more rotational inertia it has. The more mass of the pulley, the smaller the overall acceleration is going to be. Okay. So if I want the tensions, T1 and T2, given my acceleration, I can just plug them in here and plug them in here. Um, that will give me this equation and this equation right here. If I want to get the torques that are acting on the pulley, okay? Again, I just take my tension equations, plug them into my equations for torque, and I can get those. And finally, if I want the angular acceleration, my angular acceleration is negative A over R. I can plug my acceleration equation in here and get that angular acceleration. So, you know, putting numbers to the, the system um, here, I said M2 was 20 kilograms. Um, M1 is 10 kilograms. I know that if there's no other uh, inertia in the system, Basically, uh, we would take the difference 10 divided by the total mass, which is 30 times the acceleration of gravity. I would get roughly about 
um, three meters per second squared for an acceleration, maybe you know, 3.2 meters per second squared. But notice with that extra inertia here from the pulley itself, okay, we actually have a reduced acceleration at 2.8 meters per second squared. Given that acceleration, I can calculate uh, the tensions. T1 is 128 newtons. T2 is 138 newtons. So I can clearly see that there's more tension on this side than there's this side. The rope doesn't have um, constant tension across it. Constant tension is from here to here. It interacts with the pulley and then from here to here. So we actually divide that rope into two different parts. 